As you came in, you would have seen uh, a photo, uh, and the photo's up on the uh, projector up there. Um, and that photo is significant because that photo uh, was the last fight of a period where, as a gym, we went zero and six. So for our professional fight team, we went zero wins and six losses. And so as a coach uh, who cares about their fighters, who uh, cares about the gym, that's a burden to carry. Um, and it's a burden to carry because when you care about someone, you get in the ring uh, and you pick them up off the mat and you console them and you sit out the back with them and you see their partners and their loved ones and you see how it affects them, you carry a piece of that with you. And so after that fight, uh, I came back to Melbourne and it was hard because I was in this feeling of despondence. And it's like, I think it's natural, it's natural then to feel, you know, the expectation, the expectation of what, what does my team expect of me? What does the, uh, the Muay Thai community expect of me? And that was a hard one to take. It was. Um, those of you who live here, I'm sure, and some of you have come from afar, and I appreciate that, especially if you have come from Melbourne, uh, you would have accessed the ocean before. So the ocean is a great tool, and I'm sure many of you here have used it. And for me, it was an opportunity to get down to the beach, take my shoes off, um, to walk on the, along the sand, and it was a really windy, really windy day. And I was down uh, near Bird Rock, <clears throat> and I sat down on a rock, and it was like it was the, one of those real windy days where the sea kind of kicks up, and you get uh, like froth and, and bubble and sea foam coming off the coming off the sea. And the rock that I was sitting on, it was sitting, it was coming up, and it was landing on the rock. And it was a it was a really powerful moment for me because it, it, as I watched the the froth and the bubble sit on the rocks, I watched it evaporate, and that was a really good reminder. For me, of something that I already knew, I just got caught up in my in my own uh, in my own stuff, and it was that you know hard times are finite, like they're like you know like a, a fighter who gets knocked down on the mats. You've got you know 10 seconds to pick yourself up and get on with it. So that that hard time is finite, but you do have the opportunity to get up. <clears throat> and those and watching those bubbles on the rock was it was a good reminder of that, and that the rock. Is the sub, you know, it's the sustenance, it's the, it's the substance, the stuff that actually means something. It's always going to be there. Um, so I also preface, also preface this conversation because I'm going to talk a bit about being kind to yourself. But um, you know, I'm a really bad loser. <laughs> like I've always, I've been, I've got a life ban from two indoor sports centres in Melbourne, <laughs> from the Brunswick. Football Centre and from the Thornbury Recreational Centre or something. So I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert in this stuff. It's like I'm, I'm on a journey like everyone else. And if any of you saw me in the path to Hex Cage recently, you would understand that I'm still along that journey. But I am, uh, as Jules put, I am an expert in my own story. And that's where uh, lived experience comes from, being an expert in stuffing up and learning from it. So what has professional fighting taught me about kindness? Because it's a weird, it's like a, it's a bit of a juxtaposition. A couple of people people like, had a chat to me, they're like, what are you going to talk about? People are a little bit perplexed. But professional fighting taught me to be kind to myself. In particular, how to measure success in consideration of self-worth. I think that's what it's done for a lot of people. It taught me to appreciate failure and mistakes as an essential part of high performance. Like we have to have those to uh, to learn from them and to get better. And that's what you know we're doing every day in the gym. We're making mistakes, we're failing, and then we're improving from that. And the you know the martial arts is just the perfect metaphor for for life and for hard times. Um, it taught me to how to, how sharing kindness with others is is a powerful thing, and how it has a sustained impact, and it's an impact that that rolls on. It has a domino effect. Professional fighting, as as for for a lot of people, has taught me about fear, and that fear 
is uh, an innate part of who we are. And it taught me how to sit with it, invite it to a dinner table, but be conscious and cautious of the fact that it's there and be considerate of how much time to give it and space to give it at the table. It taught me how, fighting taught me how to motivate and find purpose. Uh, and when you've got purpose, that's, you know, it's the life force that um, provides happiness and, and motivation. And I think and finding, finding purpose, part of that is about finding how to be authentic and have authentic relationships with people. Uh, and that's a really powerful way to motivate them as being authentic and presenting as truly you. So professional fighting taught me about kind of so what, like it, it seems like a bit of a strange thing, but the reality is that most of you already know the answer to this and that, well, all of you probably know the answer and it, it rests within some of your earliest memories. So if you could take a second and whether you're comfortable closing your eyes or whether you're comfortable looking at your hands, if you could do that for a second, and think back to your first experience with kindness, like profound kindness, and how, uh, how that made you feel, and maybe what it felt like, and what you learned from it. And now as you bring your eyes back up to me, um, how has it influenced you as the person you are today? And in turn, has it influenced those around you? And it certainly has for me over time. So I used to train at a gym uh, in Melbourne called Renegade MMA. Uh, and there's a coach there who's an incredibly kind man. Uh, and as a person, as a coach, he had a pretty profound impact on the way uh, that I live my life and influenced me. Uh, and so I was fighting up in Gold Coast, and it was my professional MMA debut. It was also my last MMA fight. And, uh, you know, leading up to the fight, like especially I think your pro debut, is there's a lot of expectation, like, your whole social life becomes, you know, in, uh, uh, focused towards this fight. Every conversation you have is, oh, how's the camp going? How are you traveling? And you, even isolating yourself somewhat from social circles because you're focusing on this fight and all, everything you're doing with your nutrition, with your sleep, everything's focused to this one moment. And I know for me that I felt like I was carrying the banner of those people who were showing me support. So I felt like I was representing them and I was representing the gym. And so with that came this, this feeling of responsibility. And so in that fight, within about 40 seconds, I broke my hand. And it's an it's a, uh, injury that still gives me a lot of grief today. And I felt it and I knew it was broken. And I managed to see the first round out in the second round, I was finished by Tico, I ended up breaking my orbital, had a broken hand. It wasn't a great night in the office, and those of you who were there might remember that. But out the back, uh, when I sat out the back, I just had this, like, I felt like I'd let everybody down. I felt like the people who I'd represented, I'd let them down, I'd let down my gym, I let down myself, let down my supporters. <clears throat> and later on in the evening, uh, that coach, he pulled me aside and he had some words that kind of really stuck with me. And they were, they're words that uh, show a demonstration of kindness that has influenced the way I coach now. And it was, he's like, nothing changes. Like, it's, it seems so simple, but he's like, nothing changes. So when you leave here today, all those people who you're representing, they still love you. You know, they still support you. And certainly if they don't, then they're probably not worth having on your team anyway. And it was just him reframing the situation in, in that moment and, you know, bringing it back to why it actually means something, like, what, like why I'm actually doing it for more than the win or the loss was really valuable. And, you know, I think that, that kindness, that, that uh, moment of really good coaching has gone to influence me to want to do this 
you know, and, and, and do this forever. Um, who here, who here, like maybe stick your hands up if you played junior football, like junior football. Stick your hands up. So most of the room. So stick your hand up if you can remember your win-loss record from the under nines of the, you know, Werribee Wind Turtles or something for 1995. <laughs> now stick your hand up if you can remember a coach or a teacher that's had a profound impact on you as a person. In Thailand, like we, we spend a lot of time in uh, Thailand. So uh, I love Muay Thai. It's what I, so it's probably my, um, you know, it's my main passion as a martial art. We like going there and experiencing it and um, I love teaching it. And the Thais have a really unique way and different way of considering, you know, a fighter's journey. And they, rather, when you're there, rather than asking you if what your record is, your win or your loss, as we tend to do here, they say, how many fights have you had? You know, who, who have you fought? Uh, where have you fought? Where did you come from? And when I was thinking about this, and like when you start to put those questions together, you start to put together a story. Like that, that, tells, that tells a story about someone's journey. See, the tires, they're more interested in, not in your, whether you've won or you're lost or you're really good, they're more interested in whether or not you have heart. Because that's their, that's their measure of uh, a fighter. That's their measure of the person, is how much heart they have, how much courage it took to get there. And I'm not, <laughs> I'm not saying that winning's not cool, because <laughs> I love winning and I hate to lose. But there's more to it than the wins and the losses. The, incent the wins are just like a nice little incentive along the way, along the journey. Um, I used to uh, train at a gym called Ring Gym in Braybrook, <clears throat> and we had UFC in Melbourne. So UFC happened in Melbourne, I can't remember what year that was. And I'm pretty sure most gyms in Melbourne started getting these guys that would come through into the gym, and they'd be wearing like jet ski T-shirts or like Monster Energy drink T-shirts, and they'd walk in with their chest up, and they'd like, <laughs> kick over a chair or something, kiss a baby, and they would say, I want to be a fighter. Like they, everybody, everybody got these guys coming in, and we got one. And he, ca he came in and we're like, okay, well, if you want to be a fighter, if you want to fight, these are the things that need to happen. You need to be consistent. You need to be a good teammate. You need to show respect. You need to show discipline. You need to just keep rocking up. And he did. He kept coming. Uh, and he did that for about five months. And it was finally time for him to have his amateur fight. And we told him, so, we've got you an amateur fight. <clears throat> the next day, he wasn't there. And then the day after, he wasn't there. So the next week, we called him. We're like, bro, we've got you this fight. Where, where are you? And he says, oh, I'll, be, I'll be in. And when he walked in, the guy who had walked in with his chest up, walked in with his shoulders hunched over and his head down and he looked broken, he probably was. See, there's this perception versus reality of what it is to be a fighter. And I think some people, some people think that to be a fighter you have to be um, free of fear. You have to be impervious to anxiety, to fear. And if that's your misconception about what it is to be a fighter, and you walk in and you start that journey, it's going to be a very tough road. See, the reality is that everybody has fear. And there's fear that keeps us safe. There's, you know, the fear that is the here and now that stops me touching a, you know, a hot element or, you know, jumping in a, you know, the lion's enclosure at the zoo or, you know, running across a road with my eyes closed. There's, there's that there's the fear that keeps us safe in the here, here and now, but there's also this future fear. And that would have been great, this future fear of the what if, like what if. And this, this fear manifests as anxiety often, the what if, and our brain's in overdrive. 
wondering what might happen to us. And this is part of all of us. And when we're a, like our tribal ancestors, that was great because you wanted to worry about what if because you didn't want to get kicked out of your little tribe. So if you get kicked out of your little tribe and you got abandoned, then you're probably going to starve to death. You know, but in modern day society, like, and in lieu of saber toothed tigers and like spear wielding neighbors, well, it depends where you live. I guess we live in Torquay and we don't have met too many spear wielding neighbors, but you know, that, that primal instinct, it manifests as, as a little bit different these days. And that's like the fear of, you know, being abandoned or, you know, not being accepted. That's super common. And it can be a real problem. But it's there. It's there. I think, you know, for, for a lot of fighters, that kind of manifests as like, for some, especially when they have a loss, is about avoiding failure. They don't want to do that. They, don't, they feel like they're going to be ostracized. And I think that, that that anxiety, that fear, it takes the place of joy and contentment. And, that, and that's why we're on the journey. I think, you know, for, for many, like there's lots of professional fighters here in this room. And I'm pretty sure, like most would agree, that it's the most formidable enemy that most formidable opponent that any of us will face inside or outside of the ring is that fear of not being good enough or fear of failing. And that's why I think it takes so much courage to do this and why it's, it's so admirable. You now I had, uh, I'm running the junior classes again over at Bones over there. We're currently doing a special as well, 14 days, $14 for 14 days if anyone's <laughs> interested. The ambulance wasn't there for us. I think it's from the Rowland Pools. Um, I was running the juniors class today and I had their four to sevens <laughs> year old group, and they're funny, but we do, we start uh, we start each session with um, a word of the week, and so our word of the week is kindness. Believe it or not, it worked out like that. It's kindness, and with the five to seven year olds, if you ask them, if you say, "Who can tell me what kindness means?" Every single one of them will put their hand up. The whole group, the whole room will have their hands in the air. Then you go, oh, you know, little Billy, you know, tell me what kindness means. He won't have a clue. You know, but they all had their hand in the air and, you know, they, they might stumble through it, but they have a crack. And then we do our teens class a little bit later in the day and you go, you know, who can tell me what kindness means? And no one will put their hand up. I guarantee every single one of them knows and could elo eloquently tell you what kindness means, but in a room full of people, they don't want to stand out. They don't. They don't want to look like they're going to fail. Um, but the reality and something that professional fighting has been such a good teacher in helping me understand is that fear is always going to be there. It's about kind of recognizing that it's there in all of us and accepting it, recognizing where it is in our body and then coming up with tools to help negate it, to help manage it. It's about recognizing when it causes us suffering and when it's keeping us safe. But we all have it, even professional fighters. Um, you know, if you think and, and if you can think about the stimulus of a fight, so you're going through all these things, uh, you've been working towards something for maybe four weeks and then you finally walk into the venue and you walk past everybody and it smells, you get in the locker room, it smells like liniment and outside you can hear the fights before you and people are getting knocked out and the crowd's cheering. Oh, that's a big moment. And to keep somebody, and this is now from Matt, the coach, to keep somebody in uh, a space where they can be uh, of rational thought and can strategize and can truly be in the performance and choose, it's a balance because it's natural to feel fear. It's unrealistic to, to calm them down to the point there's, you know, butterflies circling around their head and they're hovering off the ground. It's not going to happen, so it's about managing it. So I've got a tool, I've got a tool that I use that works really well. And it's something that you can take home and you can use it for yourself. I used it this afternoon before I came here. Uh, I use it often. I use it with young people when they come off the mat and they're feeling anxious. I use it with fighters out in the back room. So, might use Dave. 
So this is Versace Dave by name. He's one of my fighters. So what I'll do, we'll find somewhere in the dressing room. Dressing rooms are full of people, all right? There's a lot of people there. So I'll take the eyes off them. So I'll turn them to face me. And I'll say, I want you to find a point somewhere up there on the ceiling. I want you to focus on it. See if you can focus on that max sticker up there, all right? And now I want you to bring your, stretch your arms out as wide as they'll go and bring them back a little bit further, as far back as they'll come, a straight line. Now I want you to fill your lungs, breathing through your nose, and slowly move your hands forward as slowly as you can. And I want you to notice the edges of your vision. Bring them forward, and when you see them, then drop them down your side. Perfect, good. And we'll do it again. So hands go out to the side. Fill your lungs through your nose. Slowly exhale, slower. Nice, drop them down. And one more time, I want you to do it slower this time. So breathe in slow, move your hands as slow as you can. Perfect. Thanks, Dave. So that's a really useful tool of bringing someone who has tunnel vision, who is, is in their own head, back into their body. Brings them back into their body, and it gives you a sense of being back in your body. What's a, when, you're, when you've returned back to that state and you've got out of that what-if thinking, it's good to give yourself another DVD to pop into your mind. So we'll do, we do a little visualization. I do this with uh, most of my fighters, not all, but most. And I'll have them sit down in a quiet place, usually the same place I just had them. Sometimes I'll put a towel over their head depending on the stimulus. And I'll say, let's just run the first 15 seconds of the fight through. First 15, from the minute the fight, they say fight, so the minute you touch hands, you're going to breathe deep through your nose, and the fight starts. What does the 15 seconds look like? And I'll count to 15 in my head, and I'll say stop. So let's go again. Do it again. You run out, you touch hands. And I'm installing this hard drive. I'm kind of rerouting the what of thinking and the negative thought. And then I'll give them something to, to hang on to, something, a, a, a goal post. They can write the rest of the story. I say, what does the end of the fight look, look like? What does it feel like when you're getting your hand raised? You know, like professional fighting is about entertainment and, you know, without you know, the paying crowds and, and, you know, being in nightclubs and things, you know, there is, there is no opportunity. So I think as entertainers, it's really important that, we figure out where the performance starts for us and where the performance ends. And that's a tricky thing for some fighters. You know, and when you're performing at the highest level, just recognizing that you don't actually have to be outside of yourself pretending that you can actually be and you can choose in the performance. It's about managing the, the fear and the anxiety that comes with it. The, pro the, the, the catch is that if we can't do that, we don't actually get to enjoy the journey that we're on and then what is it worth? I've got, I've got a, a, a fighter, and she, um, she had a really bad experience uh, with an, uh, the culture of another gym before she came to us, and and her own the, her own stuff that she brought along to that, and for her, she wanted she loved Muay Thai, she loves the sport. But the joy had been sucked out of it because of the fear of not being good enough and the fear of failing again and what people would say to her. And her brothers operate like they, one of them fights, uh, not fights, one of them uh, plays high level sport for Australia and another one has a really prestigious job. And so there's this, she feels like she needs to, needed to step up to that. And she said this publicly, so I don't mind. And I asked her permission if I could uh, talk about her in this way. And she said, <laughs> she said yes which was good. And she came over to the gym and, it, you know, from, from my own experience, from my own lived experience of losing and knowing what it feels like and having a good coach there to help, you know, to show kindness in that moment, to help guide me on the way, I was able to guide her back and give her reframe and get distance and perspective from her own feelings of what if and bring back the love of Muay Thai. And she actually got back in the ring and had a fight. 
and she lost. She lost again. But she showed tremendous heart in doing so and was proud of that. Remember the lesson that the tires have for us, that it's about the measure of the fighter, the measure of the person, uh, and is about how much heart they have. And this is a really useful instrument to measure success in all walks of life. And not on whether, whether or what the result was. It's about, you know, what you learned from the experience, what you gained. Was there substance to it? I had some other young fighters and well, they haven't left me yet, which is good. They might after this. And they came to me. They were having similar cultural issues, the place where they're at. And one of them had given a tremendous amount of his life uh, to this and loyalty and blood, sweat and literal tears to uh, a gym. And he became uh, disenchanted with the way that the, the, uh, the leadership at that gym were, were treating them. And it came to a head one day where they were threatened and abused at that gym. And normally, and so they left. And normally that would be the end of it and they'd move on to a new gym. But they had a fight in one and a half weeks away, professional fight. And so when they, when they came to me and uh, sat down and asked to speak to me and were so authentic in their, their, their reasoning and their want to pursue the fight and their reason for their motivation to pursue the fight was about mateship. It was about, you know, fighting for your mate and fighting for principle and fighting for values. And so that, for me, that's inspiring. Like that, that is the journey. That's the substance. That's the rock that, you know, the bobble and froth, froth landed on that day on the beach. And they got in there and they won the fight. So they, we took them there. They fought for themselves and for each other and they won. And that was, you know, a great so uh, source of inspiration for me to be there and see that, and that just embodies what I'm talking about. That's the substance, that's the grit, that's something that they will remember forever, much long, you know, when they've forgotten about the result, they'll remember what they fought for and what they stood for. You know, that, that kind of authenticity in terms of a relationship, in terms of communication, is a really valuable lesson for us to be open and honest and to truly be when you're when you're in conversation you're in relationship with someone that's what I'm doing right now this is Matt Williams <laughs> and I'm not I'm not I don't mean like full expose I don't mean like hey guys I cover myself in shampoo and sing Tina Turner when Lani's not home it's it's I, I don't but I just mean I just mean like this is the weird shit that pops into my head I didn't write that down I just mean you know, like letting a little bit more of you into the room. And, you know, if you're going to inquire about how someone is, you know, ask and mean it and be there and use eye contact and be physically present. And when you do that, like when you do that, it gives other people permission to do the same. And if you're, if you're a leader, there's many leaders in this room in all different walks of life. If you're, you know, if you're a parent or if you're a coach or if you're, you know, a boss, you know, this lesson that I've learned about being authentic as you, it inspires others to do the same. And I would encourage you to recognize when you are in a performance, when you are performing, and to let more of you into the room. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we were up on the Sunshine Coast and we were at Lani's dad's house and she's described her dad's house <laughs> as camping indoors. So he's in the... He's in the rainforest, you know, you're not quite sure where the outside starts and the inside meets it. And it's a great place to go and to get, you know, p perspective and to consider things that are going on for you. And for me, what was going on for me is I told Jules about three years ago that I was doing this and I left it to the last minute. I was like, man, I don't. I haven't spoken in public for a while. What am I going to talk about? And then I had that moment um, on the beach and then the, the most serendipitous thing happened. So I was in there and I opened this book 
<laughs> I opened the book just because it was massive. I was like, man, that's a really big book. Uh, I opened the book and the first, it was on Australian poetry, and the first poem was this. Choose believe me or not, but it was, life is mostly froth and bubble, but two things stand like stone. Kindness and another's trouble and courage and your own. Crazy. Now, if the author of that poem, Adam Lindsay Gordon, would have been there with me on the beach that day, I'm sure he would have had some advice because it just it just hits the mark. And like I want to kind of close by saying that, you know, sport is a human story, which is why I thought it was such a great um, kind of starting point to kind of steer this conversation and to celebrate celebration not only of physicality but also the things that make us human. So kindness, courage, and connection, which is what I've been talking about. It's the, it's the, it's the, the substance of what I'm talking about, the rock. Professional fighting taught me not to sweat the small, but small stuff, the froth and the bubble. It taught me to accept that fear is human, and it, but it's manageable. Fighting taught me that, and this is important, that when the memorial mason carves my stone, that he fought with courage and he was kind is a pretty good way to be remembered. Thanks.